so as I was walking through the halls and the floor in the morning, I spotted three people. Three people that I had the exact same conversation last week. And I bet you by the time I'm done, 10 of you will want to have the exact same conversation with me. And you're probably wondering, what is the conversation that I had? It's really about what's happening in the space and what can companies do as they go through the disruption, energy transitions, and whatnot. So, the first thing that I want to tell you is that you have the power to change the game when it comes to transitions and uh, disruption. Now, it feels like that it's, it's more TED talky and big and, you know, something along the line that people do inspirational speakers, but this is really the truth, that you do have the power to change the game. And I'm going to tell you three things that will help you make the decisions to change the game. You know, the, the, the challenge is that there are so many things changing in our industry so quickly that people are absolutely petrified to make the right decisions. Uh, or worried about making the wrong decisions, to say the least. And with these three things that when they are equipped, when you are equipped with it, it's going to help you make the right decisions. And you don't need to worry about this. So, before I get into the fact, what are those three things? Because I want you to keep on looking at me and listening to me, and I'm going to tell you what those three things are. Um, I want you to, I'm going to tell you something that's going to surprise you. If you own a BMW, or if you have Michelin tires in your car, or if you have insurance with Blue Cross, or you fly Emirates, or you do any of these things, and by the way, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of imagination, you're coming up against the work that we do at Control. So you see, we're already working together, and you had no idea who we were. So. What is the first thing that I'm going to tell you on top of the fact that you can change, you have the power to change the games? Most of you already know it in some capacity whatsoever or, or other, that there is no energy digital, uh, transition without digitalization. So before I move forward, I should just probably explain the difference between digitization and digitalization because a lot of us use those two terms you know, interchangeably. Digitization is something that our industry has been doing for a very, very long time. Right? That's taking analog data, it's taking physical things on paper and turning it into something that's digital. Digitalization is in fact the process of taking that digitized data and using it to transform your business processes, transform your organization so that you can improve your uh, revenue, you can reduce your costs, or the other things that you might need to do. See, I'm going to throw you a few numbers at it as to why digitalization is so important for energy transition. Do you know that as of 2022, IDC estimates that there are about 64 zettabytes of data available in this world? It's more data than our inf storage infrastructure in the world can actually store at any particular point in time. I'm going to give you another number. It is also estimated that you're probably going to have 175 zettabytes of data by 2025. Some more data points. 90% of the 64 zettabytes was generated in the last two years. That's pretty impressive. As people move to do, due to COVID, move to home, they are generating a whole pile of data. They're doing a lot more on the internet. We're just collecting, replicating more and more data. Another interesting fact is that by 2025, out of that 175 zettabytes, 80% of that data is going to be unstructured. So we are talking beyond the databases and the way how we store things. So as you're looking, so all this information, all this data that's being collected, not only that it's going to give you access to more information, but it's also allow you to make better decisions, assuming you can harness the, in the power of the information that comes out of this data. I'm going to give you some more, uh, some more data points. You know, our industry has been digitizing for a very, very long time. Just to give you a scale, a sense of scale of when we're talking about 175 zettabytes, what does it mean, right? I'm going to take some really, really big uh, data sets within our industry. So if you're looking at a remote uh, subsea inspection output, 
An approximate remote subsea inspection report is about, or data is about seven terabytes. At the same time, if you're doing a land seismic survey, a good one, you're looking at about 20 petabytes of data. And these are some of the largest data sets that our industry handles. Now, in this day and age, our data is not limited to just the physical you know, acquisition or the production data or the inspection data. It's also coming from drones. It's also coming from videos. It's also it's coming from voice, if you think about it. The decisions that you make, if you are recording those, all of that constitutes the data that your company is generating. And if you can harness all that information, you can not only take advantage of what's available, which means that you can make your processes more efficient, you can reduce your cost, you can access the additional levers that might be available to you, such as if you wanted to invest in non-core areas outside of the industry, such as in oil and gas, which is my background, that let's say if as an oil and gas company, I would like to invest in um, an electric grid or if I wanted to focus more on uh, batteries, technologies, or, you know, put a solar plant in, uh, so solar panels in, or uh, wind power in. So just the mere act of digitalization gives you the ability to help with energy transition. And again, I will repeat what I said, that because you have so much data, that the individual transformations that are needed such as improving your optimization on a, on, a, on a well site, or removing, demanding people from hazardous situations. All of these things require consistent data-led input, which means that there is more proliferation of AI, analytics, machine learning, IoT, and other deployment of technologies, just as crucial to deploying solar, or wind, or uh, nuclear power, or, or anything else along the line. So now, I'm going to give you an example of how does it translate into real world. So Saras Energia is one of the leaders in the European refining industry. They uh, manage about 300,000 barrels a day of, of output. And during the, during, because of the volatile nature of, of the industry that we are in, right, you see the oil prices, they go up, they go down, and all of a sudden, you know, there is a quite a bit of impact on, on the economics of an organization. They went, uh, the Saras Energia decided that they needed to uh, digitize this process, digitalize this process, and they needed to ensure the communication between these plants, that they have actually two depots and you can see a terminal in the middle. They wanted to ensure that they had uh, secure and reliable communications between all these things. So they went on a digitization journey, they partnered with us, and one of the outputs of, of the deploy technology was that we completely demand and automated the plant that you see on the, on the left, on, on the, actually the left side, which is the Cartagena plant in Portugal, with very minimal supervision, supervisory staff just because of the regulatory requirements. So, more, so everyday tasks such as loading, storage, transportation, across more than 5,000 applications on a day-to-day -day basis are being done fully automatically to ensure that they get the output that they're looking for. Not only that, there will be all the people that have been um, removed from the plant, so they have been put on to do uh, value-added tasks, and by demanding the sites, they have been able to see, save about 600,000 uh, man hours, 6,000 man hours of uh, safety of, and without any incidents. So the first thing that I tell you in, our, in, the, in the game of, you know, in the game of changing the game, is that there's no transition without digitalization. The second thing I'm going to tell you, which is the completely opposite of the adage that we've always heard, is that slow and steady does not win the race. In fact, if you're looking, looking at what it means, I'm going to give you some, some numbers on this thing. The, when you're looking into uh, our industry as a whole, I've been here for about Two, almost two decades serving this industry in the city. And one of the most common phrases that I've heard is that we'll wait for somebody else to do it before we will do it because we want somebody else to take, you know, take the first step at it. 
It's perfectly fine if you're looking at incremental changes or you know, if you copy something, it doesn't have a negative impact on the company that all started it. But when you're looking at the age that we are in right now where data is moving faster and disruption is happening faster than we can keep an eye on, that, that doesn't work. So you really have, you know, in the classical sense of strategy, you really have two choices. You can create advantage by either reducing a cost or creating a differentiation. In fact, I would go as far as to say that the, uh, the only true sustainable advantage that any company has is agility. Because everything else you, uh, that you create or innovate will be replicated by somebody else at some point in time, probably sooner than you can think. So the faster you can go, the faster you can take the advantage. I'm going to give you three data points very, very quickly. 9.7 billion. This is the estimated population of human beings in this world by 2050. So now if you think to take this number in context, I will ask you this question, are we really in an energy transition or are we in an energy race? Because by 2050, our industry has to figure out how do we securely and sustainably deliver this energy to 9.7 billion people across the world. And the people who, companies who do it first will absolutely have the better advantage. A couple more data points just to, you know, you, you already know these things, but I'm just reiterating so you get the uh, magnitude of it. It is commonly understood that a, a, a producing field will decline at a rate at about roughly 8% per year, assuming there is no additional investment in it. And if you look at the current economic environment and the uncertainty, a lot of us are not investing into it. Another thing is that less than 1% of investments are being done by oil and gas companies outside of the core business. In fact, there was another data point that I found that I didn't put it in here, is that SAP, which is you know, the underlying for, uh, business system for a lot of companies, they estimate that approximately 1% of all data that is collected by a company is actually analyzed and translated into value for the organization. So when you know in these type of numbers, what is it that you can do to really, you know, speed up the, speed up the game? The one thing that I, would, that, that I could suggest to you is expand your ecosystem of partners, right? Because in our industry, we tend to stick with the partners that we know. And if you look at the, you know, the partners that you've been working with for the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years, they are going through the exact same disruption that you are going through. So it is, more imp it is imperative that you partner with organizations that are either in a different part of the industry or different industry altogether that are perhaps a little bit farther along or the technology providers that are helping those industries move forward. I'll give you three very, very quick examples of some unorthodox partnerships. Joybird is a furniture making company and Sherwin Williams makes paint. But every month, Sherwin Williams has palette of the month. So what Joybird did is they take that palette and they coordinate color of the furniture to coordinate with the palette that's being sent. And the per per perspective here is to give advantage and give more value to the customer so they don't have to go around and look for coordinating furniture. Another one which is what very surprising to me is BMW and uh, Louis Vuitton. You know? One makes cars, one makes handbags. But if you think about it, both of these companies are in the business of travel. So when the BMW launched the i8, Louis Vuitton launched a set of four travel bags that fit perfectly in the rear parcel carrier of the i8. Because they're both in the business of travel. One takes people, one takes stuff. And the third one I'm going to give you is Amazon and American Express. So Amazon wanted small business owners who operate on their platform to get better handle on their expenses and more control on, on their expenditures. So they co-branded a credit card with American Express. So as they spend, the American, say American Express gives them uh, the analytics to further optimize their cost. That's just a few examples. The example that I will give you as part of Kindrel is from Boardcast. Boardcast is a utility company out in, in Republic of Ireland. One day, they saw on Sky News that there is these ransomware attacks that are happening. So all of a sudden, the team gets up, stands up a people of 30 plus people, 
and the manager in charge spent about 20 plus hours on the set weekend to set up the security patching and whatnot, which took about six weeks to do. Then they decided the same thing, that this is not sustainable, they engaged with us, and what we did is we automated this exact process all over again. So instead of now taking six months, six weeks per quarter to do this security posture, it's being done every six hours with the press of a button. The critical point here are the last two lines items that you see here. It's the reduction of incidents from almost 500 to zero, and again, people are being removed from doing these mundane maintenance tasks to focus on value-add value -add activities. So we know the two things now. The third thing I'm going to tell you is flip the script on automation. What does it mean? So the challenge with our automation, the inherent reason why we don't really trust automation as much, is that we have designed automation not to take advantage of the things that humans do best and take away the things that humans don't do good. For example, what do I mean by that? Human beings are actually not really good at monitoring things. In fact, one of the things we don't do a good job is monitoring things. Think about driving a car for three hours and what happens to our sight. We start losing perspective of things. What human beings are really good at is finding solutions to complex problems, but they definitely are not good monitors of automation. So in our view, we find this automation view somewhat inaccurate and archaic. So what we are doing here is that, in fact, I, I, would, I would step back. I would even say that if you, you know, we've been talking about predictive and uh, descriptive analytics for a very long time, but the uh, end result for that is exactly that. Let's do the analytics, give the result to human being so they can tell the machine what to do. What we are focusing on is right at the bottom of you see here. Meaning that we are designing automation that is allowing human beings to be actively, cognitively involved in the decision-making process, but allowing the machines to make the decision. So in, or in other words, allowing humans to be custodians of automation instead of monitors of automation. I'll give you an example here. Dow Chemicals, you know, they have operate in many countries and they have a lot of locations. They generate a lot of products and some of these need to be shipped at tight deadlines. So one of the issues that, that Dow had, you know, when COVID-19 was coming is that the procurement of the tools that they needed and the choice that people had to do the things they needed to do. So they engaged with us to give the power to users so they can make the decision on buying the tools they need, improving the availability of the tools or computers, whatever the uh, task things are at their disposal, and being able to extend the life of, of what's being done. And again, the outcome of that is exactly that. I keep on hitting the same point over and over again. Removing people from mundane things like procurement, like uh, supply chain, like uh, doing invoicing. If you can automate all, this past, uh, all these things across different geographies and different languages and whatnot, then that's the advantage that you get by removing these people from mundane tasks and putting them onto doing value-add things that bring value to the organization. So just to recap, I'm, I'm done, by the way. So what are the three things that I, that I told you that, that have the power, that, that will give you the ability, the power to change the game? No energy transition without digitalization. How is it crucial? Slow and steady does not win the race. And you must flip the script on automation if you want to win and succeed in this game. And that, now you have the power. My name is Farooq Akram. I, my, me, myself and my team is out there on the floor for the next three days. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer you. Thank you.